Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you here. My name is Patricia Lewis. I'm the Research Director for International Security at Chatham House. And I am delighted to introduce our three speakers this evening. We're going to be looking at international security institutions, a closer look. Um, but we've also got the excuse of a new novel uh, that's come out called The Heart of War, uh, Misadventures in the Pentagon. And as somebody who once got lost by herself in the Pentagon, um, I really resonated with, <laughs> with a lot of this. It's a novel uh, by Kathleen McInnes, who's here with us this evening. Um, and she's going to be speaking about a bit about what prompted her to write this novel, but I do recommend it for you. And I, I gather we might have ways in which you can buy it. Oh, look, it's sitting there. That's good. <laughs> um, so um, we're going to start, uh, first of all, with Kathleen, who's going to speak to us. Now, I should say that she's here in her personal capacity. Um, she's currently working for the Congressional Research Service. Uh, she has worked in the Pentagon. She also has worked at Chatham House. Um, and we're delighted to have you back, Kathleen. Um, we are then going to talk to, um, uh, to hear from Catherine Dixon, who's a former British diplomat, background in counterproliferation and nuclear threat reduction, um, and has spent some time in uh, Shanghai, which is a fan fantastic city. Um, worked also in the Ministry of Defense, uh, covering Afghanistan. Um, and um, she has also worked as Transparen in Transparency International as Director for Defense and Security, where she led an international team supporting anti-corruption reform. So she's got defense sector, she's got foreign office, she's got overseas experience, and she's got non-governmental experience. And is now working as a consultant in, in, in the same field. And then we're also going to hear from Heather Williams, who is at King's College, who's a lecturer in the defense studies there, former Chatham House as well, I should say. We're very Chatham House uh, first. And I'd like to say, you know, it took you to page 79 to mention Chatham House in your in your book there, Kathleen. So I just want to mention that. But you can talk about that a bit later. Um, and currently, Heather is speaking, uh, uh, is working on US-Russia arms control. So we're really hoping, Heather, you might be able to say a few words to us about what the hell is going on with the INF Treaty. That would be really helpful. So I mean, one of the things about this evening is that we've got sort of a tri triangular uh, approach uh, in that we're, we're looking at what's going on in the world and the mess it's in what the institutions are doing and whether our international institutions, our government institutions are fit for purpose, essentially. And then what can women do about it, right? Do you think that's the right approach to what we're going? So Kathleen, over to you. Oh, thank you, uh, Patricia. It's, I'm absolutely delighted to be here uh, to come back to, to Chatham House, which took very good care of me um, while I was doing my PhD a couple of years ago. Um, my story for writing the story of the heart of war, misadventures in the Pentagon, um, started in 2008. I was on a Secretary of Defense Gates trip to Afghanistan. And we were traveling from one of the provinces outside of Kabul uh, to Kabul, ISAF headquarters, uh, the NATO headquarters in, in Kabul. And so we're flying. And we're, we're, we're passing over the Hindu Kush, and, and, and Kabul starts spreading before us. And that's when uh, one of the soldiers pointed to me and said, hey, do you want to sit up the back? You know, and I'd seen pictures before of, of soldiers sort of, you, the, the ramp is down, um, you have your, your legs over the ramp, you're strapped in with a, a harness. And, and I thought, great, that's a great idea. I'll take some pictures, you know, what a unique vantage point. And I, so I strapped on this harness, and then with my body armor, sort of waddled to, to the, and then I sort of scooted butt first to the, to, the, to the edge, and I stuck my legs over, and I saw my feet and cobble and nothing in between them, and I was absolutely and utterly terrified. And it occurred to me, it would be interesting to tell a story of how somebody like me, who's never served in the military, I've been a national security professional, but somebody like me, how, how I, somebody like me would end up in a crazy position like that. Um, so that was the, the genesis of the, the story. But as I got to, to writing it, it started off as a memoir, a, you know, a, a collection of anecdotes of different things that both you know, me, myself and friends in the Pentagon experienced. Um, and, but as I, as I got to writing, it, it, was, it was clear that there weren't very many books out there that were looking at sort of what's happening in headquarters, what's looking at how the bureaucratic structures work. Very few uh, from a perspective of women. And, and again, as, as, I, as I started trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the project, when I realized that part of 
what I wanted to show was a, a story that would appeal to folks both inside and outside the Beltway, in, in the national security community and outside the national security community, help walk people through what it's like what, what are the challenges that we experience? Um, and, and do so in a way that didn't feel like you were eating your broccoli. Um, is that it would be compelling enough to keep people turning the page. And so it became very clear that fiction was the right tool to use. Um, because you can create a dialogue with your audience in a way that a lot of the nonfiction works that I've done before, I just didn't feel like I, w I was able to do. And Charles Hill at Yale tells he, this wonderful book, Grand Strategies, um, literature, statecraft, and world order sort of suggests to us that fiction and art can be great tools for starting to contemplate uh, international security challenges, uh, challenges of statecraft in a, what he calls a methodologically unbound way. So we can, we can contemplate things more creatively when we use these analogies. Um, and, and it seemed to me that that would, again, it lent itself to my project. And indeed, I learned so much about the national security world by writing this book and then by sharing it with different people. Um, I really started to begin contemplating the Pentagon and, and our national security institutions in a very different way. And I just share three, three ways in which uh, the book, three insights that the book taught me. Um, first of all, the organizational design of the Pentagon. I mean, the Pentagon is almost a character in and of itself um, in, in the book. Um, and, and, but how is it organized and how is it um, interfacing with broader national security institutions? Are, are we really fit for purpose? Uh, on the one hand, we have an institution that, that, as one of the characters says, it's basically designed for dysfunction. It's designed for slow movement so that you, know, there, you, you don't get tectonic shifts between administrations. You've got think, you know, a, a, a body of uh, people and policy positions to, to to chart a smooth course forward. But when you're dealing with situations like in Iraq and Afghanistan, where you have to win the hearts and minds of you know, Afghans or Iraqis or wherever, and it requires agile action, is, is, is this really the right structure horizontally and vertically to be able to deal with these things? Um, how does interagency cooperation work in, in those contexts? Um, the second thing that the book taught me was exactly how much the Pentagon and our national security institutions more broadly are absolutely based on people. You hear the, 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 the phrase, uh, people are policy, and that's very true. It's a very human place. Um, the way that the characters eventually are able to their, muddle their way forward is through their human connections and their relationships they build with each other. And why that's becoming, a, I think, an increasingly critical national security issue, or what it raises for me, is we're, at least in the United States, we've had budgetary dysfunction, we've had um, continuing resolutions, we've had furloughs, we've had um, the civil service has been subject to headquarters reductions. And so retaining the people that are necessary to keep the institutions going is getting harder and harder because the system isn't, is, isn't geared to support its people right now. And I, 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 again, the, the book taught me that we really need to pay attention to that. Um, and then the, the, the final thing that the, the book really taught me, and I, I finished writing it in, in 2000, before the, the 2016 election. Um, and so it was what taught me, and as I've been reflecting on, is how important it is for us as national security institutions to find ways for women to express their voices in an authentic way. And what I mean by that, um, DOD has its cultural roots in the military services, which have been inherently male dominated forever. Um, and so and when I was working NATO in Afghanistan, it was, I, was, I think that the, the gender balance was not, I think it's better today than it was. And if, but that said, the, the, while the, the gender balance is changing, it doesn't seem to me that the culture has quite caught up. And that matters. It matters because, uh, in my experience, the, a place like the Pentagon, again, with these ma very masculine cultural traits, by which I mean your, your, your full range of emotional responses to a particular issue or, or uh, instance is you know, being stoic, 
getting angry or laughing. And there's very, you know, any sort of other uh, emotional response. You know, I, I get frustrated, I get passionate, I get, and th but that wasn't appropriate. And I remember being called out by some people. And th that's one of my major strengths as um, an analyst. But it was viewed at the time by some as, as inappropriate. So I, th and it made me feel like I couldn't authentically. So, so all this is to say, um, the, the gender balance is changing. I think we've got a lot way, uh, long way to go in terms of our culture, but it's essential that we do because unless women are able to find their authentic voices at the table, we're missing out on a full range of options that we could be giving our, our policymakers. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, yeah, I mean, from your experience, how much does this resonate and, and how does it differ on this side of the Atlantic? You know, like I was planning before I um, read the book, which I did rapidly um, yesterday, uh, to say some very serious things about you know, security. Um, but what um, hasn't been said is this book is actually just really funny. Um, and I, you know, I laughed quite a lot while reading it. And uh, many of the things in it just really um, reminded me of quite a lot of funny or just, or just things that happened to me that really kind of then came back to my memory. And I think, um, you know, I started my career, I did it the other way around. I started straight in government and then left government um, to go and work in, the N in an NGO um, afterwards. But I started work um, at the old war office as my first job as an analyst in the MOD. And I came straight from studying my master's degree at SOAS, which um, for those of you that are British will know is the kind of the uh, peacenik central of, um, of the UK. So it was literally, they had the stop the war protest starting from SOAS as I was just joining, you know, the old war office. So, you know, the first thing that I kind of realized, I suppose, which I think the protagonist realizes in the book is that the, the people are basically decent, you know, which it, when you work in it, you, you take it for granted. But I think it reminded me that I didn't take that for granted before I started. Then the second thing, you know, like Kathleen's uh, protagonist that surprised me was the complete lack of interest in expertise. So I done. I was very serious about my level of expertise at that time. I thought I knew all about China, and then I was just sort of lumped on the on the Afghan desk, which I guess would have pleased your protagonist. Um, and I was quite surprised by that. And then the third thing that jarred, of course, was the, was the gender, the gender balance. So I was often the only woman in the room, and that is, you know, a little while ago now. Um, and most colleagues were fantastic, but I always felt that my manager hesitated in putting me into the room sometimes because he was concerned that people wouldn't take our team seriously if, they, if I was the one that was representing it. And I was always conscious that people that came, visitors that came, just assumed I was the support officer. So I kind of, um, I felt like I had a choice that I could either proactively assert my right to be in the room or I could be overlooked. But I didn't have the opportunity to just have natural, easy charm and succeed. Um, which I think a lot of men probably do. If you, you know, if you have that personality type, you can succeed just by being sort of a bit more relaxed and charming, whereas I felt I had to be a bit assertive. Um, but the biggest shock for me, which again is something I think your protagonist um, experienced, which was um, that government was just, it, it was more benign than I imagined, but it was just sort of less good than I thought. <laughs> and um, I had this um, instinctive uh, veneration for the corridors of Whitehall before I started. I was a sort of comprehensive school kid from the middle of England. And there were all these sort of wise looking men doing important things, matters of state and all that. And uh, it was, you know, I was crushingly disappointed uh, when I realized that this, this very quietly spoken, serious gentleman who was, uh, you know, my boss's boss's boss, who worked on the top floor, who incidentally always had teletext on as if he was about to leap into action with breaking news at any moment. But he was, you know, he was, you know, neither kind of remotely motivated nor capable of, of pushing a serious security agenda. Um, and that, it just really disappointed me. But it was um, in one of my midterm reviews when my manager said to me that maybe I, you know, might have some issues with the hierarchical nature of the MOD and wasn't really suited for me that I realized I needed to jump ship to the Foreign Office. Um, and I loved working in the Foreign Office, uh, but it too had its quirks. And my first meeting uh, with my head of department, he was a fantastic chap. And he, he, knew, he was, again, really serious and earnest and had these bright red socks on, which I remember vividly. And he said to me, Catherine, I've got a piece of advice for you that my head of department gave me when I first joined the Foreign Office. There's a niche in the Foreign Office for people with good drafting skills. 
you know, and he really earnestly sort of knowingly looked at me and, and it was just so far from what I thought I'd imagine joining the Foreign Office to do. I was here for action, to, to talk to foreigners and tell them what I thought, not, not for sort of perfecting drafting skills. And I'd never, I don't think I'd ever heard the word drafting previously in my life. Um, but of course I managed to contribute my own um, comedy of errors to the, to the party. And the most absurd incident that I sort of brought to the Foreign Office was when I was working in uh, William Hague's office. And he was having what I remember being a pretty sensitive meeting with a load of Egyptians just at the time when um, Israel, I think, was, was bombing Gaza quite um, badly. And uh, it was a sensitive meeting, and the Egyptian ambassador was late, and I offered to go and get him. Just so I. All oh, right. Well, no, there's nothing, uh, okay. nothing now just, that is. Uh, but I very cheerfully introduced <laughs> the late arriving Egyptian ambassador into this room of um, Egyptians, only to discover, in fact, he was the Israeli ambassador that was here for another meeting. Uh, <laughs> so you know, if you think government's not always that good, you know, often you're a you're a part of the misadventures. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, despite all this, you know, I learned that security institutions in this country, at least, you know, have some brilliant, dedicated and highly capable people in them. But we also suffer from a deep lack of expertise, I think, and um, or experts working on issues. People have expertise, but they're often not using it. The lack of time for strategic thinking and an inability to integrate uh, the people that find out things with the people that know things, with the people that are making decisions about things. And I felt we often t um, were less taking action than reacting to what the initiative of others. Um, you know, and how else could you explain Britain getting involved in Helmand, which was a place which uh, the Afghans there remembered uh, defeating the British in, you know, spectacularly uh, during, during uh, Queen Victoria's reign. Uh, so they thought they'd kicked us out once, they'd do it again. And, you know, how could we choose that province of all provinces? Um, so I was glad to leave government and um, TI taught me a lot. I think there's a lot to be said for, you know, breathing in the oxygen outside government. Um, and I um, really enjoyed looking at all of the issues that I'd looked at in government through a completely different lens in TI. Um, and that was a lens of corruption. So we looked at radicalization and state fragility, the way that you know, violent extremists use corruption in order to secure recruits. Um, you know, and I reflected that many of the well-intentioned efforts to build capacity in Afghanistan actually translated into support for predatory institutions and people you know, who were in power that we didn't really understand. And similarly, I thought about all of the efforts that I put into when I was working in the minister's office to demonstrate we were giving support to our partners, the Ukrainians, the Iraqis, you know, on, on, you know in, in security, in the security area. Um, but in TI, I reflected, you know, that this wasn't perhaps always the right help um, because corruption often destroys the institutions that are supposed to provide security. So, of course, when ISIS gained huge ground, um, they did it with a well-organized well and equipped um, force, which was, you know, combating, you know, a completely disorganized but highly expensive Iraqi army, which had many Gulf soldiers on their rolls. And then, of course, there's the, the big shifts in, in global power, where I think corruption is also interesting. So if 20th century has been about hard power, I think the 21st century is going to be much more about you know, the battle for institutions, for organizations and ideas. You know, the Orange Revolution and Euro Maidan in Ukraine were outbursts of public frustration, reactions to the control of institutions by a corrupt elite, but not just the corrupt elite that were Ukrainian. Um, it, it was also uh, many of the people behind it were, were Russian, and this is the use of corruption as statecraft by one state to control the institutions of another, which, of course, you know, we, we are asking many more questions about in the West. And I think we need to think this, about this a lot more with the rise of China. You know, China has this stated ambition um, to transform the world through the One Belt, One Road initiative, more investment than the World Bank and the IMF combined, many times more investment. And you tell people that the Chinese Communist Party wants to transform the world and the norms and institutions that we have, and people, they stop, they look at the amount of money and they, they think, crikey, this is a big deal, and then they go right back to Brexit. Um, so, you know, for me, I think this is the big challenge of our era. Um, and it's one that I don't think we're, we're very well placed to grasp, particularly in, in Europe. And the, the challenge this side of the Atlantic is not really about interagency. I actually think in the UK, we're pretty good in the Foreign Office at working with DFID and the MOD. We kind of moan about it, but when you read this book, you realize that actually we're all like one seamless, <laughs> tightly knit team. Um, our problem is our failure to really understand who our friends are. 
um, and to work with them to forge like long-term strategies for the for the liberal for maintaining the liberal world order. Um, and I love the bit, bit in the book about about France, where the you know the defence secretary in the US basically gets the UK defence secretary to do something by saying that if he doesn't, he'll do it with France. You know, which is is so true and so depressing. You know, we still suffer from. Uh, from competition between states in Europe and with um, the last thing that we need when we've got this rising authoritarian ambitious power is to have fragmentation and competition in Europe. Heather? I mean, how personally did you take this book? Uh, very. <laughs> uh, the names are familiar. Um, <laughs> so the protagonist is called Heather. <laughs> um, well, first, thank you. Chatham House and Kathleen for the um, opportunity to discuss, to be up here and to talk about the book. Um, before, I should say, before I came over to the UK, I'd worked in the Pentagon for about five years, um, mainly as a contractor. And so a lot of the stories in the book resonated a lot um, and, you know, caused a little bit of um, you know, trauma uh, in recollecting them. But also there were some things about the book that I found really helpful in trying to understand US policy decisions now. It's this really fresh reminder about how policy happens, that it isn't this clean and neat process. It's much messier. And uh, as I was reading the book, there was a lot of drama also going on about INF. And so I actually found the book provided this really helpful framework for trying to understand INF. So that's what I thought I would try at least to share with you all today. Um, but so from Heart of War, uh, Misadventures of the Pentagon, there were three main themes that really came through powerfully for me and uh, definitely resonated. The first, again, is, which I think we've all hit on, which is how policy is made. Until you are somewhat on the inside and see the personalities and the pressures it really never, even when you are inside, it never really makes sense. Um, I think of it as more policy making, it's more, it's more of a soup than a sandwich. You don't know every single thing that went into it. You don't know how it was blended, how it was processed, or what happened. Uh, but there's a, there's a soup in front of you, as opposed to the sandwich where you can see all the different layers and how it got put together. There's always internal negotiations and time pressures. And that observation, I think, is so important right now, looking at US policy making, um, particularly on, on some issues more so than others, um, as we see, there's so many capacity problems in the US right now. There's staffing issues. And so a lot of those challenges are just being exacerbated and on a, on a higher scale. Um, the second thing that, really, again, resonated with me and has been mentioned is the role of powerful personalities. It's not just that people matter. It's that very powerful personalities are dominant. There are bullies, it's, it's no shock, but the bullying can have policy consequences at times. There are people who claim their turf and just will not budge. And they don't stab you in the back, they stab you in the front in order to get it. Uh, so that resonated as well just a little bit. Um, it's not just at the senior levels, it's also at the working levels. Again, I think that this is particularly important in how we're analyzing policy making now when you have in the US administration this isn't a partisan statement. You have a very powerful personality at the, at the head of government. Managing that personality and figuring out how he communicates, how he makes his decisions, that permeates throughout the rest of government and really drives the way um, that government is, is operating. But also, again, because there is such a lack of capacity and there's so, such understaffing, those powerful personalities are more powerful than ever because there's fewer people to challenge them. There's fewer people to push back. So that was a second theme. And then the final one um, is about something I didn't learn until I left the US, and it's the challenge of managing allies. And parts of this book about allies in particular, I think could only be written by, somebody, by an American who had lived in an allied nation and understood just how allies see us. And particularly in the UK, this, um, I wasn't going to say paranoia, but that's not very diplomatic. Um, I'll say hypersensitivity to the health of the special relationship. Sitting in Washington, you don't feel it quite as acutely. But when you get out and you see how the US is perceived, it's clear that the challenges of working with allies are sometimes greater than the challenges of working with adversaries. Um, they might be preferable, but they are still um, challenges nonetheless. Again, really important right now with um, regards to NATO. 
29 members of NATO, at least 29 different perspectives. U.S. has some credibility challenges with its allies, um, but you see different threat perceptions towards Russia. Um, it's very clear that NATO is not a monolith right now. And again, that was that those kind of dynamics came through, I thought, really strongly, mm -hmm. particularly in the, the final third section of the book when Heather goes on an adventure to uh, Royal Horse Guards. Um, and so what I, and so those three kind of themes is, as I said, I, I tried to think about them with regards to international institutions, not just security or domestic ones, but particularly to arms control and the global nuclear order. Um, so we're at a very dangerous time with regards to nuclear institutions right now. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is uh, facing significant polarization for a variety of reasons. We have a really difficult review conference coming up in 2020. The U.S. has announced its intention to withdraw from the 1987 INF Treaty. It has withdrawn from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran. And then we have treaties like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which are just in limbo. So all of these institutions and the practice of arms control, which we once really relied upon for predictability, we don't know what the future of all of this is anymore. Um, so those themes that I mentioned, what can they tell us about recent movements on INF, for example? So the U.S. position, uh, the U.S. for years, since or officially since 2014, has been alleging that Russia is in violation of INF. Russia alleges the U.S. is in violation of INF, and the U.S. has said it intends to withdraw. Um, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, this is just because John Bolton doesn't like treaties. So there's the powerful personality. But I'd also say it's a lot more complex than that. And that's where the policy making is more soup than sandwich. There are different domestic stakeholders at play here. There's different bureaucratic interests and turf battles that are probably going on. But also, from the US perspective, Russia's been violating this treaty for years. Why would you stay in a treaty that the other side just isn't observing? And patience is running thin. So this isn't just as simple as it's one person who doesn't like it. It is much more complex than that. There's also concerns about China. Um, and uh, different concerns within NATO. Um, to the, the issue of allies, again, allies are, um, the allied perspective makes US, the US position on INF pretty challenging. The majority of US allies support the INF treaty and want the US and Russia to continue to observe it. Um, however, they haven't really been pressuring Russia to come back into compliance with it, despite repeated requests from the US. So again, Allies don't always do exactly what you want them to or what you tell them to. Uh, I don't think everyone in Washington realizes that sometimes. Um, but, and then also an issue with allies, and this is just going forward with international institutions, uh, withdrawing from treaties doesn't really help your credibility. If what you're trying to do is prove that you're a strong international leader, uh, who's gonna wanna partner with you if you just keep withdrawing from things? That's, that's a pretty significant credibility challenge. Um, and I just, uh, again, the US image abroad, I've lived here for eight years. Uh, this is easily the worst that I've ever seen it. Uh, and so just to wrap up, uh, a few quick observations about um, the experiences of women with all this. Um, these are all obviously very personal. I'm only speaking for Heather Williams and not for womankind or academics writ large. Um, I did want to highlight the academic angle because, again, the book really touches on this in an interesting way. And being an academic who regularly engages with government, one challenge, it's probably not surprising, government often doesn't really want to talk to academics. Uh, they'll say things like, well, you don't know the whole story here. What could you possibly have to tell us? What could you possibly know about nuclear command and control? Or something like, or things like that. Um, I find that's actually a bigger challenge than the gender, than any gender challenges, to be perfectly honest. It's the government, non-government divide. There are definitely times and places when that is appropriate. Um, and knowing when to challenge it is, um, you know, can be, can be difficult and a bit sensitive. But also, sometimes when governments come to academics, they're coming to you because they know the answer you're going to give them, and it's the answer that they want. And I think academics often face the challenge of I don't, you don't just want to be a government mouthpiece. Maintaining independence is really important. Um, but if you want to engage with governments, it, it's a difficult balance. Um, on women, this is, one, this is a challenge that I consistently face, and Patricia has seen it many times. There seems to be this assumption that all women are pacifists. <laughs> or are pro-disarmament, or pro-diplomacy, or pro-soft power over hard power. 
And I get this a lot um, when I, particularly when I interact with the Department of Defense. I don't know if it's just a gender issue so much of, of it as is, oh, well, of course you would support arms control. You're a woman. I've had people say things like that to me. Uh, that's, a, I think, part of that experience, at least for me, has been trying to overcome that stereotype to some extent. Maybe I go too far to the other extreme at times. I'm looking at Patricia. Um, but uh, that's, that was just one observation. And then final observation is about the US versus the UK. Again, this is purely personal. I've just found there seem to be a lot more women working specifically in the security and strategic studies space in the US, and a lot more women willing to mentor on the US side. Um, I'm very lucky I found a mentor on the UK side. But um, on the other hand, I find the UK government much more willing to interact with NGOs and academics. I think that's partially because of the nature of the UK government system, where you, you know, it's predominantly generalists who rotate every two years. I'm in a new post. I don't know anything about this thing called INF. Oh, here's an academic who does, and you can bring them in. And so it, I don't think that either side has that type of interaction figured out perfectly. It's uh, just, just some differences. Um, and so I think with that, I'll just uh, wrap up. I think the issue is less polarized here as well. Um, yes. So I think that's the other thing. There's more continuity between governments in the way it used to be in the US. Uh, prior, I would say, to um, George W. Bush, actually. Up until that point, there were some variations in emphasis and so on, but there was continuity between Democratic Party and Republican Party who was ever in office. If you look at President Reagan through to then Bush through to then Clinton, for example, in recent memory, you can see that continuity, and it broke down over, over Bush. And if um, George W. Bush had actually brought in some academics, he might not have been so quick to invade Iraq, and indeed might have had a plan afterwards. Um, <laughs> I think it was. It just got ignored. <laughs> it just got ignored. So, um, I, and this is, this is absolutely fascinating. And I, as someone who's sort of worked in um, the UN, every time I hear people talking about government bureaucracies, I think the UN is really good. You know, it, it, it has its problems, but when you think about, you know, the 100, 190 plus countries all trying to work together in the various structures and the secretariat trying to make those things happen and the turf battles that go on within the UN, it's certainly no worse than government bureaucracies, um, particularly as I've seen in the, in the United States as well. And one of my other comments is in the United States, whenever anyone mentioned NATO, what they meant was Europe. Whereas here in Europe, when everyone mentions NATO, what we really mean is the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're talking about the same elephant, uh, but from very different perspectives. And I think that's really important to remember. And I was just thinking about that today, um, I sat in the audience listening to, uh, I'm sure some other people were here too, listening to a discussion on women in the military. And we heard some really fascinating things, particularly about women in combat. Um, and it's uh, one of the things that, um, that uh, we heard was how it's, it's the little things that make you feel like you're not supposed to be there. Uh, it's the uniforms not fitting. It's the helmet that you had Heather in the book falling over her face. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it's not having enough bathrooms or any bathrooms. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's those little things that keep telling you you're not supposed to be her. And, you know, not being brought into meetings, being thought that if a woman's in a meeting, it might lessen somehow that process. And, and then we heard about how significant and important women in combat are um, and how, it's, how it makes a material difference to the way operations work, how it's made everyone better, how it's tapping into um, talent that wasn't there before because it's going across society, how it's changing the way people think, how, about how it's challenging the way the military think and how good that has been for the militaries which have included women in combat. And I think we can see that in um, Norway, we can see it in Israel, we can see it in a number of countries around the world where, where it's made a, a material difference. So, and I think that's true in international policy circles. Um, it is just what we call cognitive diversity, different um, approaches to things, bringing different types of brains to the table. And gender plays a part in that. But Heather, you're quite right, it's not the only thing, right? And also, there isn't a single experience that women bring to the table. We bring as many experiences as all the men bring. We're all individuals with all different knowledge and experience. And that's really important, I think, to, to remember. Um, but in the bigger picture, you know, our institutions are struggling, aren't they? They're struggling with 
the world order, the, or the disorder in the world, the turbulence in the world. So I guess one of the questions that we have is, you know, in this discussion, what, what would people be able to do within those institutions now to help make them fit for purpose? Isn't that the question? I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about the INF Treaty a lot as well, Heather, and I think that you know, one of the things that I can see very clearly is how this has been a gift to President Putin. Um, you know, so you had Russia being accused by the Obama administration, actually, um, of non-compliance um, for many years now. And in withdrawing from the treaty, suddenly it becomes President Trump's fault. And it means that there's no longer a treaty to hold Russia to account, right? Or anyone to account. So immediately, Russia's off the hook if the US withdraws. I mean, how, if that's obvious to me, why isn't it obvious to everyone in the United States discussing these things? I'm pretty sure it's obvious to President Putin. Um, so how do we get some common sense back into this discussion? And can women play a role in that, I guess, is the question that I have. So I don't know, Kathleen, Catherine, Heather, do you have any comment before I go to the, to the audience? It's, it's an extraordinary question that's cutting to the heart of so many different challenges we're facing. Um, I think to the, this broader question of are our institutions fit for purpose? Um, within the United States, we've been talking about national security reform for decades. We, we've recognized that there is a challenge, that, that we had the Hart Rudman Commission in the late 90s saying, you know what, we're not really prepared to like, deal with terrorism or identity. And not very far after that, we had the terrorist attacks of 9 11. And we still, I mean, so we, we saw these things coming, and from an institutional perspective, we operate within these, we, we call them cylinders of excellence or silos, right? And so um, getting the cross-departmental coordination is getting more and more difficult um, because, and, and because everything filters up to the top where, the, where, where governments, departments come together and take decisions with the president is in the White House itself. Well, there's so many different issues. On, it, it's, it's, the, the, we call it a bandwidth problem. There's so many different things that anybody in the White House and the National Security Council, our principals, have to, have to grapple with on any particular day. And so, as a result, the tyranny of the, these immediate inbox sorts of driven um, actions and issues crowd out our ability to think strategically. That's a problem. And, and so, you know, on the one hand, you sort of look at what, what's happening with, with INF and some of these, these arguments, and you, you put the question, you know, can we inject some sense? Not until we actually find a way for our leaders to be able to make sense of the world. Are they being driven by the wrong thing? Are they being driven by the headlines? Are they being driven by you know, interagency issues or personality arguments rather than the good of the country or international security? Are, are, do they need to step back and find the right drivers of their decision making? Is that the problem? Um, I think it's, it's I, I can't think of any senior US national security leader that I've interacted with since the beginning of my career who would say that, no, it's not an issue, right? That, 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 it, that, that they have plenty of time to do this deliberative thinking. That um, they all will uniformly say, their work is too headline driven. And um, all of a sudden, you know, like, the, we weren't going to do, be, you know, we saw the rise of ISIS, we weren't gonna do anything, we weren't gonna do anything, you know, it's, it's, it's in Iraq. It's, and all of a sudden it was a thing because of, you know, what happened to the journalist. And, and so these issues, a small issue that they said, no, we're not gonna do that stuff, all of a sudden becomes a US intervention in Iraq, but sort of Syria, and just from there. If you'd had the ability to step back and take a look at, at the strategic situation, and breathe a little bit with it, maybe we would have a different outcome. I, and I, I, I don't know which would be better or worse, but I just wish that our leaders would have some more time. Um, another thing that you brought up um, is about the, um, the, the differences between treatment with women and, um, and, and, and how women in the military perceived these sort of, um, I would call them little microaggressions, right? These little things that let you know that you are not like the others. Um, I think that the Me Too movement has been enormously powerful. 
Um, we, there was a national security Me Too movement. It underscored some pretty horrific stuff, um, which we're going to be we're going to be grappling with for a while. But one of the longer term consequences of this is that we finally have a grammar to be able to compare our experiences. We're finally able to sort of talk with each other about how things are different and why that's the case, and and help our you know a lot of our male colleagues who want. To, it's not that they don't want to be allies. The culture is so ingrained that they don't know necessarily how to be. We're, we're finally coming up with a language to be able to move forward on these issues. And it's going to take time. But I think it's, it's just so gratifying. Two years ago, we could, I, I, I couldn't have identified the kinds of things that I have and, and realized that I'm not unique. And I think that's important. So I'm, I'm actually going to. I know our two speakers want to, the two other speakers want to speak, but I'm, I'm actually going to go out to the audience now because of time constraints. So, um, are there, is there anybody who wants to uh, put a question on my table? If you could, in, in, in the middle there, thank you. <coughs> if you could identify yourself, say where you're from, that would be really helpful. Hi, I'm Abigail Watson from the Oxford Research Group. Um, I was interested in um, the, the, the sort of the, the different standards you were, you were perceiving as yourself as a woman trying to be in that, that security environment and saying how, how you felt that your emotions were sort of set to a, a different standard and you couldn't be authentic. It seemed to reflect a lot of your comments. And I just wonder, like, what, what is the role that women can actively p play? It sort of seems like if we blame the system, you can end up feeling like a, a passive driver in it and you can't do anything. But is there a way that we should be interacting when we... I, I was especially struck with your comments about how you, whenever I, whenever I interact with the Ministry of Defence, I feel like I go too far as well, that I have to be pro-war so I don't seem like a pacifist woman. And is there a way that we should be interacting with that so that we try and change the system and we're not just blaming it for our inability to compete with its standards and I'm sure for this ourselves. is an issue for men as well. I'm sure this isn't just an issue for yeah, women. It's yeah. about who, being yourself or being authentic and not trying to fit into some expectation of who you are, bringing, bringing your true self to the table, as it were. So at the front here, please. Thank you. I'll take a few together. So. Um, Gilda Rapp, um, Centre of International Peace Building and a member. Um, yes, I think this is a very crucial issue, and we've all experienced you know, the, the sort of specialised uh, position you're being, uh, the, the special position you're being put in. Somehow you can't get away from that. Uh, and how do you transcend, you know, your role as I know something about the field, I have a role here, I have a, a function to perform, uh, and actually I'm speaking from that place, but I'm aware of how I'm being perceived, uh, and how do I manage? So we've always got this double job of managing the perceptions of us and deciding how to respond to them and how not to act into them to make people then say, ah, oh, well, this is a feminist, or, you know, uh, they're just kind of, you know, being strident or they're pushing the for women's rights. Sorry, I'm not yeah. talking into the mic properly. Um, because we talk with our hands too, which we shouldn't probably. Um, so, you know, you, your experiences are really very, very fascinating. And I've been in this situation myself also, obviously. And um, so I think it's terribly important to hang on to who one is and, and to but be aware always of how one is being perceived. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments that people want to? Right, well, in that case, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to Catherine first and get your reaction to some of the things that have been said, Catherine. It would be really... And particularly if you can perhaps shine a bit of light on some of the things you touched on about corruption, which I thought was a really interesting point. Um, and because that's, a very, that's also a very gendered... In my experience, it's a very gendered issue as well, the issue of corruption. So yeah, people often, I have the same thing that you have, that I think that people think that they have to explain to me like how much they care about transparency before I even start, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, great, you know, I'm really glad about your commitment to transparency before you, you know, have a serious foreign policy conversation with people, because corruption is about power, it's about the abuse of power, and it isn't, you know, it's not really about, you know, just sort of being transparent to everyone. Um, but I guess, like, in a way, I was, I was never really conscious on some level of, of the way that I came across. 
And uh, it is a bit strange when, you know, I mentioned I came from this comprehensive school in the north and we streamed in the comprehensive school um, and I was in the top set for maths and science as you'd, you'd hope I would be, I did a science degree. And there were 40 kids in that top set and there were seven boys. So I, you know, and we had an all-female cast of Macbeth in the school. You know, I grew up with, boys were sort of slight losers, really. I mean, they weren't in charge. They were, you know, busy being sort of a bit rubbish and not really getting on. So, you know, it was quite a shock for me, really. It was only, I think, in my late 20s that I became aware of this whole kind of cabal of sort of public school males that dominated our institutions. And I didn't really think about that before. But then I did, I did notice the way that, that they behave, you know, that they're on, I think it's unconscious bias. I mean, many of them are just phenomenally brilliant, kind, you know, people who wanted me to succeed. And I think I always approached issues by, I, I always end up, whatever I was working on, just caring deeply about something to do with it, you know, where I was never really worried about how I was perceived or whether I was doing well in my career. I was much more interested in whether I could persuade this person to agree with me and, you know, and then, you know, you don't think about the other things. But I did notice, um, you know, some sort of senior male colleagues making assumptions about women. Um, and I think the, one of the assumptions was that, that men are kind of good at policy and women are good at people. So if you are a woman and, and you're a serious policy thinker in the Foreign Office, you sort of has, have to find some way of demonstrating that. So I kind of got used to demonstrating that. And then you see some women who demonstrate that to an extreme, who then become quite spiky and difficult to work with, and you get this whole kind of pink on pink thing going on. And you, you've got to forgive it, because what they're, they're just so worried that no one's going to take them seriously, and that they're going to be all about people, that they're not about people at all. <laughs> and you, sort of, you want them to kind of calm down. So you know, I think it drives women to behave quite strangely. And what I tended to do, you know, I often use humour as a way of calling it out or, or um, you know, um, or just, you know, trying to help people see the unconscious bias they had. And I remember being in a meeting where, you know, when I was speaking, like, you know, someone's tapping on the table and they were doing it with another woman and a man gets the, the, the floor. But, you know, I think, you've, I think you've got to gently pull it out, you know, call it out when you see it. But I do think that doing it through humour, because people mostly these days are well-intentioned. Had um, you know two women prime ministers in the UK has, is different to the United States, for example. Uh, how much do you think that has had an impact? I was, I mean, I was thinking about Heather saying that women are often assumed to be the, the peace builders, the peacemakers, but that's not always how we might see them here, given our experience in terms of um, women leading us into war, for example. No, I don't know that I've necessarily experienced that. I suppose one thing that I felt sometimes in the Foreign Office is that um, being tough with a, was a virtue, you know, and it's particularly, you know, through the era of Iran, of, of Russia, you know, that, that um, you know, maybe, you know, if you, if you didn't agree with, like, a sanctions approach, you know, you maybe weren't being tough. You didn't really understand that Iran was trying to build nuclear weapons and that you were a bit soft and this kind of use of language, you know, and I think sometimes women got a bit tra assumed to be soft or described as breathless. You know, I remember once hearing a woman being described as breathless, you know, for sort of suggesting that we should talk to, you know, a country rather than being tough. You know, so I think those things, I don't, I, I think probably it's not always so gendered, but I, I definitely felt that there was some language around that. Mm -hmm. Heather? I also don't think I was that aware of the gender, gender issues, probably until five to ten years ago, and that's mainly because when I was in, when I was working in Washington, I was surrounded by female peers and friends who were in the same field. And it, it, it's almost like it isn't until someone starts pointing it out that you just see it everywhere. And realized, uh, or you know, things like, um, I would be called naive. Mm, that's, a, that's, a, that's a classic one. So um, I still get this one a lot when I'm like, you know, there are benefits to be had from arms control. Oh, that's so naive of you, Heather. Um, and that's something I previously, I don't, I, I still don't even know if that's a gendered, a gender issue because it isn't always obvious. Sometimes they are gray areas or microaggressions. But it's something, um, but to, to your comment, this is a challenge that I found particularly since I've started thinking about it, is what is, it's a, it is a perception issue. It's particularly about being invited to events. When you, you usually know if you're being invited because you're a woman. 
Um, I've even had people say to me, oh, we need gender balance on the panel, so we thought we'd invite you. Um, so I, I say this so people are aware of it, but I also say it because it does actually put women, that's a really hard position to be in. Because I say, well, I don't want to do that on principle. But if I don't do it, are they just going to go to a man? Or are they going to go to a less qualified man or woman? Should I take the platform while I can have it? Or do I stand by my principles? So we next week have a session called End to Manos, which we're looking yeah. at. But one of the things, so this happened to me in my career some 25 years ago, right? So it's still going on. It hasn't changed in 25 years. And that's really disappointing. So one of the things that I decided 25 years ago when I was invited at the last minute to a conference, as that keeps happening, uh, because obviously they suddenly realize they haven't got a woman, um, is my attitude has been from then is if there's, I'm not going as the only woman. So if you want me to come, you have to invite at least one other. Yeah. So that's my version of an end to manuals. You know, in principle, uh, in principle, but also in practice, I don't think mantles make sense anymore, at least on a lot of the issues we work on, because there's just so many qualified and interesting so you women. You really work hard at having but a men only panel now. You do. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, yeah, it, when you get asked to do yeah. it, it it's, it's awkward. But then, just very quickly, too, because I think Abigail's question was a really, really important one to highlight those emotional kind of challenges. And one thing, I never realized that I did it until recently someone pointed it out, is a lot of the times, I found this particularly with the military, working with the military, everything is black and white. This is the way that it is. If you want to get your point across, you have to kind of, you compromise the language a little bit to get into that space. And sometimes in the course of doing that, you downplay yourself because you don't want to seem threatening. This also gets to pink on pink violence. If there is a senior woman that you're working with and you want to get your point across to her, do not come across as threatening. And so we constantly are demonizing ourselves and putting our own work down. And I used to think, oh, but I'm doing that just to get my point across. And sometimes it's successful, but I actually, in hindsight, I actually don't think that that's right. I think that, and so this idea of we are emotional, some men and women are, we're all emotional beings. Um, but in terms of how you navigate that, I actually think one of the most important things is just having confidence in your own convictions. Uh, don't compromise on things. That does, you know, you, can, you still should be polite, you still be diplomatic, um, but don't concede that ground unless you absolutely have to, I think. Whereas, a lot of the times looking back when I wasn't really aware of different gender issues going on, I think I was doing that a bit subconsciously. And so it's, you know, I don't want to just say, oh, it's about confidence and self-esteem. No, it's about feeling really strong in your convictions. And, you know, Kathleen did a really great event um, at, with, at the Atlantic Council um, with uh, a few months ago about the book. And I think Lauren Young Shulman made a great point, which was know your brief. The number one thing that you can do, whether you're a man or a woman, is just know what your brief is. And if you know something, don't back down from that. Well, we've got like five minutes, so I'm going to go for some quick fire questions. So we've got one, two here. Please, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, no, sorry, the person in front of you is first. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Um, Mark Cloddy, I'm a affiliated lawyer. Um, Heather, I found your analogy about policy making being a soup, not a sandwich, very succinct and profound. And if you'll allow me to take it a step further, um, I'll be interested in, interested in knowing the panel's views about where Defence Secretary Jim Mattis um, sits in the kitchen. Uh, how much influence does he decide in terms of what goes in the soup? And is he close to being kicked out of the kitchen? Oh, yeah. um, it kind of uh, is similar to Abigail's point. Um, what I was wondering, because we were talking some... Who you, who you are? Did you explain who you were? Oh, sorry. Um, Francisca, and I'm a student at UCL. Um, 
that sort of is similar to Abigail's point, um, because we were talking so much about women being perceived as pacifist, um, but what I struggle with is I can't really see a panel of men sitting here and dis um, discussing that they struggle with being perceived as pro-war, yeah. and um, how do we maybe, or women in security, um, international security institution, how do we maybe get men uh, to sit down and sort of have similar thoughts or um, a similar discussion because I think for us as women, well, yeah, um, we kind of do that and men don't, um, yeah. That's a great question, thank you. Any other questions out there? Any man want to respond to that question? Please. Yeah. Uh, Sanford Henry, fan of uh, the author and fan of the panel and fan of Patricia. Quick question, uh, who is going to play the lead in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> but there's anybody, is, is there a man who wants to respond to that? To that? Um, we, don't, we are a, a feminal, what, what are we? <laughs> womanal, we're a womanal. Um, and we don't have a man on the panel who might want to respond. I'm just wondering, in terms of, you know, can men talk in this way on a panel? I thought that's a really great question. Is there, is there anybody who's had experience of that? Um, in real life, uh, talking in this way on a, a man-only panel. Like, scary parts that we have to deal with, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? Yeah, just as hard. But perhaps we should do the manual on this. Do the, yeah. Okay, that's our challenge now. I don't know how we can actually do that because we're not allowed to have manuals. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's, let's go in reverse order. Heather first, then Catherine, then Kathleen. Um, so I'm, I use a lot of food analogies. And we've only got a few minutes, so. Yeah, the soup quick. sandwich and what is Mattis's role. My read on it is that until recently, Mattis was the head chef. And his core team was a relatively small group, predominantly in the joint staff, whereas before the civil service played this really powerful and influential role, the civil service and DOD is just much smaller right now. Um, however, and so Mattis really, I mean, you could see it in so many of Trump's decisions that he really did delegate a lot of foreign policy and defense decision making over to Mattis. And that he is then the one who decided what went into the soup, what kind of soup are we having, and go get me these ingredients. Um, it does seem that since Bolton has been hired, that I'm, I'm not sure if Mattis is still the head chef. He, uh, yeah, I think that there might be a little bit of some uh, power struggle going on within the kitchen for control of the knives. And then just a final really quick point that actually has to do with what might men talk about. This actually gets to the issue of institutions. Because I think that institutions now have this reputation of being perceived as cooperation and cooperation is weak. And so if men are gonna, you know, this idea that men, do, men have to get up and talk about being strong and they don't wanna be perceived as being weak, I almost think that that stereotype is seeping into how we think about institutions, that we just think that any cooperation is bad. And we think of institutions in this, am I making sense, Patricia? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> I think you're making sense from a particular cultural point of view. From, from a particular cultural point of view. Which is across the Atlantic. Yes. yes. Um, but it's this idea that institutions are either good or they're bad. They're fit for purpose, they're not fit for purpose. They're working or they're not working. That forces you into a binary of either supporting or or being strong or being weak. And I think that we need to rethink our approach to institutions in that way and thinking, what are the benefits that we get out of institutions? And institutions have an image problem. It's not that institutions are struggling or institutions are bad, it's that we've just started to lose faith in them altogether. And I think we can all do a bit more to talk about what are the actual benefits of cooperation from both a hard, from a hard power perspective, because they're pretty significant, I think. Great, uh, so quick. Uh, comment which is, won't sound very feminist, um, but just before that, I just want to make a plug for the term soup sandwich, <laughs> which is in the book, which I think is an even better analogy. Um, but just, yeah, my non feminist comment, which I always, I, it kind of occurred to me like recently uh, the benefit of, of uh, people not expecting much of you, which I think is the case if you're uh, from a certain type of background or you're female. Like I've met a lot of men in the foreign office who felt that they had to get to a certain position to be ambassador by a certain age, their father was, et cetera, et cetera. And I've always like, felt like I've got choices 
because I don't feel any societal pressure to do anything in particular. And I think that's given me an enormous opportunity to kind of go to TI and do something that actually didn't feel like it was the right thing to do for a lot of people in the Foreign Office. Uh, I know that's sort of a, a bit of a negative thing that's turned to a positive, but you know, I think I, it's about liberation, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, which is good for everyone. Yeah. I don't need status. No one expected me to achieve it anyway. But that's the status in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so to touch on the, the, the maddest question in a very oblique way, um, because you, you never know what it's like in the hot seat. You never really know what's going on in, the, in those dynamics. So I wouldn't wish to comment on that. But what I, what I would suggest is that um, the policy organizations, the Office of the Secretary of Defense that supports Secretary Mattis has gone through personnel turmoil uh, that is pretty significant. Um, it has uh, the policy organization itself. It's basically like a foreign service within the Pentagon that helps navigate relationships and helps set the, the secretary's priorities on a variety of different issues. That is an institution that about two decades ago chose to deprioritize subject matter expertise at a deep level, and, and prioritize being a generalist about defense policy. And what that means is every couple of years, people like me would rotate onto a desk for which I'm, I knew NATO. I couldn't spell Afghanistan when I got to the desk, and I was 27. And somehow I'm in charge of or supporting NATO's operations in Afghanistan. But that, and my situation is, was not unique. Um, a friend moved from the Africa desk to the North Korea desk and was all of a sudden, by virtue of sitting in that seat, the subject matter expert. What I'm hearing from the building now is that is having long-term implications for the secretary's trust in OSD policy. When he asks things like, okay, you're the Pakistan subject matter expert. It's a very complex issue. How long have you been at the desk? And the person answers six months. OSD is marginalized. And that has big implications for the overall civilian military relationship within the Pentagon. How do you do civilian oversight when civilians aren't credible in the eyes of the key civilian? So, th so th these kinds of nerdy, wonky, national security, bureaucratic things have real significant importance um, that, that I, I hope uh, is one of the themes that's, that's brought forward in the heart of war. Um, to your question, Sanford. So, the authors are asked, and uh, who could play the, the, you know, the lead, and and apparently sc screenwriters are, you know, thanks for your interest, <laughs> and move on. But I suggest uh, Emma Stone. I think she'd be fantastic. Um, I'm just to close up. I am absolutely delighted to be here. I'm so. And who would be the love interest? Ooh, I always put a Damon Wilson. Mm. No, Damon. Wait, what, who's the guy who was? <laughs> He was in Homeland, the redhead. Damien Lewis. Damien Lewis, that's the one. God, too many people. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, so. On that note. <laughs> on that note, um, I'm, I'm just absolutely uh, thrilled to bits that, that this, this book could be a touchdown for such an important conversation. And well, th thank you, Kathleen. Thank you for bringing your book. Um, I hope that people are going to read it. Um, I know that you can tell them how they can get it yeah. um, afterwards. And um, I also want to thank Catherine and Heather as well. I mean, I think this has been a really fun discussion. It's been very wide ranging. It's touched on a whole load of issues. I think it's probably challenged people in the audience. And it's certainly got me thinking quite a lot. The book was great fun to read. Um, it's a really good, it is a page turner. So well done, congratulations. And thank you all so much for coming and, and participating in it. Thank you.